These are complex prime numbers, known as the Gaussian primes. And they're cool to look at, but they also have some interesting properties that I'm going to talk about. And I even built a game that lets you explore them and use the primes to solve puzzles. But before we get into any of that, let's take a step back and ask, what is a prime? A very common definition that you've probably seen is a number that's only divisible by one and itself. And this is a good definition, but it's a little ambiguous. Is one a prime? One is only divisible by one and itself, but one is itself, so it's not really one and itself. But rather than using semantics with this definition, maybe let's think about why do we care about primes? Primes are building blocks of all of the other numbers. For example, if we want to write 60 as a product of primes, we can write that as 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. We could also write it as 5 times 3 times 2 times 2, or 2 times 5 times 2 times 3, or 3 times 2 times 2 times 5. But we see in all of these cases, we're using the same four primes. They're just in a different order. So if we ignore the order, there's only one way to write 60 as a product of primes. And that's not just true of 60, it's true of all numbers. Every number has a unique factorization into primes. And this is important. It's so important it's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It's very useful to break numbers down in a predictable way. And so we want the primes to let us do that. Now, what if 1 was prime? Well, we can write 60 like this, but we could also write 60 as 1 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. Or with two ones, or with three ones, and we could keep adding ones. So if 1 was a prime, we would no longer have this unique factorization. Uh, and because of that, 1 is not prime. It's kind of a special case. And with the positive integers, it's the only special case. But what if we extend the ideas of primes across all integers? Can we have primes when we're using negatives? So maybe the first thing we'll look at is negative 1 prime. Well, we'll use a similar argument from before. We can write 60 like this, but we can also write it like this by adding two negative 1s. And we could also write it like this. We can always add two negative ones because they multiply out to one. And so this would ruin our unique factorization, so negative one is not prime. And it's a similar case to one, so we kind of group them together and we say one and negative one are units. Units meaning they divide every number. And that's clear for one, any n is one times n, but it's also pretty clear for negative one, n is negative one times negative n. And because they divide every number, maybe we should edit our definition. So instead of a prime number is only divisible by 1 and itself, we'll say a prime number is only divisible by units and itself. If units divide everything, then we have to give them a caveat here. Okay, so now with this adjustment, do primes work across all integers? Well, let's go back to our prime factorization of 60. Um, we could also write this as negative 2 times negative 2 times 3 times 5, or 2 times 2 times negative 3 times negative 5, or we could make them all negative. And so, even accounting for the units, we've lost the unique factorization. But all of these factorizations have the same pattern. It's just each number is either positive or negative. And earlier we said we could ignore the order so maybe we could also ignore the sign. We can say the unique factorization is something with absolute value 2 times something with absolute value 2 times something with absolute value 3 times something with absolute value 5. And we've done this for 60, but the same holds for any number. By tweaking the rules to take either positive or negative, we now have unique factorization. Um, and essentially what we've done here is grouped together 2 and negative 2, and 3 and negative 3, and 5 and negative 5, and we do the same thing for all primes. And the term for this, we're grouping associates. Associates are numbers that are separated by a unit. 
So the associates of 2 are 2 times a unit. So 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. So we achieved unique factorization by grouping together associates. Okay, so now we want to edit that definition once again. We'll say a prime number is only divisible by units and its associates. And this definition allows us to extend primes across all integers. And it also allows us to extend them into the complex integers. So here we are back with the Gaussian primes. And these are a subset of the Gaussian integers, which are numbers of the form a plus bi where a and b are integers, and i is the square root of negative 1. And we're displaying them here two-dimensionally. The x-axis shows the multiples of 1, and the y-axis shows the multiples of i. For some examples, here is 3 plus 2i, and negative 2 plus 4i, and 5 minus 5i. Now, all of these numbers are the Gaussian integers, but the ones that are colored are the Gaussian primes. And we notice some symmetry in them. They're both horizontally and vertically symmetrical. And so we have these four quadrants that are all identical. And that's because we have four units. And we could go even further, like the Eisenstein primes, which have six units, but I'll cover that in my next video. For now, here are our four units. 1, negative 1, i, and negative i. We can see here 1 divides everything. 1 times anything is itself. And we can also see the other four units divide everything as well. Now because we have four units, that means that every number has four associates, including itself. So here is 3 and its associates, and 4 plus i and its associates, and 2 plus 2i and its associates. And we see that they all have this symmetry. There is one associate in each quadrant. And that's because the units have that symmetry. So multiplying any number by the units will retain the symmetry. So now we have some basics of the Gaussian integers. How do we find the primes? Well, again, let's take a step back and ask, how do we find our regular positive integer primes? There's an ancient method to do this called the sieve of Eratosthenes. So we start with all of the positive integers. And then we want to get rid of 1 because it's a unit. And so our smallest remaining number is 2, so it's prime. But now all of the multiples of 2 must not be prime, so we will remove them. And now our smallest remaining number is 3. So 3 is prime, but now all of the multiples of 3 must not be prime, so we'll remove them as well. And then we continue. The smallest remaining number is 5, so we remove the multiples of 5. And then the smallest remaining is 7. There are no multiples of 7 here, which tells us all of the remaining numbers are prime. And we can use a very similar method to find the primes in the Gaussian integers. So we start with all of the Gaussian integers, other than 0 and the units. Then, then we find the smallest circle around 0 that intersects numbers. And those numbers are 1 plus i and its associates. So they are prime. But that means all of their multiples are not prime. So we will remove them. Now we find the next smallest circle that intersects numbers. And here we get 2 plus i and its associates, as well as 2 minus i and its associates. So these are all prime, and then again we remove their multiples. And we will continue like this, finding primes, removing their multiples, until we are left with all primes. Now let's walk through that process again. Now we start by finding the smallest circle. And we want to note that the radius is root 2. Okay, the next circle has radius root 5, and the next has radius 3, and then root 13. And so we're starting to see a pattern. Each of these radii is either one of our regular primes or the square root of a regular prime. And if we continue, that would hold forever. All of the radii 
are either a prime or a square root of a prime. And not only that, every regular prime appears in one of these radii. So if we look here, we see the primes and how they appear either as a square root or just as themselves. Um, for the ones in red that just appear as themselves, these are Gaussian primes. 3 is a Gaussian prime, 7 is a Gaussian prime, and so on. For the rest that appear as a root, these primes are a product of two Gaussian primes. So 2 is 1 plus i times 1 minus i. And 5 is 2 plus i times 2 minus i. And the same is true for 13 and 17. And this is the case for all real primes. And so there's a correspondence between the Gaussian primes and the real primes. And so this correspondence makes it much more straightforward for us to find the Gaussian primes. And maybe you're wondering, why does this happen? And how do we know that it continues forever? We'll discuss that in my next video, where I'll be talking about the Eisenstein primes, which are another complex set of primes that are hexagonal. But for now, see if you can determine the pattern of which primes have a root and which don't. If you find the Gaussian primes interesting, you can interact with them more using a web tool that I created. It's linked in the description. I will say it works better on a desktop than on a phone. Um, you can hover over a number to get more information about it. If you hover over a prime, you will see all of the multiples of that prime highlighted in white. If you hover over a composite, you will see its prime factors highlighted in white. You can display either primes or composite, display grid lines or hide them and the labels. You can change up the colors. Here is cotton candy spiral, forest noise, and dark mode solid. One of my favorite features is the game mode that lets you jump around and interact with the numbers. And it has a bunch of different levels with puzzles to solve. And stay tuned, because I'm working on a tool that will display a bunch of other kinds of primes as well.